Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church, Wednesday night Bible study. Welcome to you, those that are turning in on Facebook Live. Glad you could be with us this evening. Now, here's what I want you to do. You that are at home, if your dog is sitting on your lap, I want you to raise your hand so we can see who you are. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I thought you probably had your dog on your lap. I remember when I was watching on Facebook Live, sometimes on Sunday morning, my cat was right there on my lap and I had my Bible and my notepad. She usually slept. So it's good to be here this evening. Good to have uh, everyone here that's here. And uh, I think we're going to wait till the end of the evening to bring up our prayer requests. I hope you have been, and I will mention, I hope you have been praying for our campers and our counselors that are uh, ministering to the kids down at Camp Chautauqua. We're looking forward to hearing what the results are, and uh, I'm sure they'll be exciting. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 4. 1 John, chapter 4, and if you remember last week, we, uh, we only looked at one verse. We looked at verse 11. And there was quite a bit there. So I've got news for you tonight. Don't panic. We're going to do twice as much tonight. We're going to look at two verses, okay? We're going to uh, look at verse 12 and 13. We'll start with 11 as we read the Word of God. If you'd like, stand up in reverence for the Word of God. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And verse 12 says, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. In verse 13, Hereby know we, that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now that you would bless as we study your word, as we take the few words of John. We hope that we do not make confetti out of it and turn it into too many words of man. The word of God is to the point, and we pray that that point would even pierce our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We look at verse 12, no man hath seen God at any time. That's a very peculiar uh, thing to me. Uh, I've heard it before. But when you're going to teach something around it, it can be a little perplexing. I want to look at the other parts of these two verses for just a second. The verse says in 12, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us and hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And if all that's true... All that is true, John says, if we love one another. Now, would it make sense that if we don't love one another, that may not be true in our lives? Well, we'll look at that a little bit more in depth. Verse 12 says, no man hath seen God at any time. We're told, basically, we're promised, we're assured that we cannot see God and survive the viewing. Who told us that? Well, let's look. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. And we're just going to look at two verses here. We're going to look at verse 20. 
Exodus, the 33rd chapter, the 20th verse, and he said, that's God speaking, by the way, and he said, thou canst not see my face. thought things were going to get interesting here. I thought I was going to have a meltdown. <laughs> and he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see, my, see me and live. The key point is no man can see God's face and live. That was stated here in verse 20, and again in verse 23. Look at verse 23. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. As far as I know, I have never even seen God's back parts. How about you? Moses did. Moses did. And then in Exodus chapter 34, the next chapter tells us that Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. Now, you know what he was doing. He was playing with rocks up there, you know. And uh, God wrote on the tablets up there in that time period. Moses had neither food nor drink for 40 days. And when he came down off the mountain, the Bible said his, the skin on Moses' face shone. My, in my mind, Moses had a green face and he was glowing, like one of those glow-in-the-dark figures, you know. I'm not sure what it looked like, but it could have been like that. If you remember, Moses had asked to see God's glory. What impact do you think it would have had if he would have looked on God's face? He'd have been dead because no man has ever seen God and lived. Now, that glowing reminds me of radiation or nuclear energy. I know sometimes people tease Randy Burke about glowing when he comes home from work, you know, because he works at Davis Bessie. Think about this, though. Why not? God is all-powerful. God is more powerful than nuclear energy, for he is the source of everything. God created everything, and without him, nothing was created that was created. That's speaking of Jesus. What other deity could of his own word speak the type of energy into existence that would cause the heavens and the earth to melt with fervent heat? It's not surprising that Moses' face glowed from seeing God's hind parts. No man hath seen God at any time. You could say, well, Moses did see God, and he didn't die. Well, here, let's do this. The next time you see Moses, you say, when you were up in that rock, what did God look like? And see what Moses has said what he says. He's probably going to say, I don't know, I didn't see his face. We think of the face of people, we take pictures of people, we take portraits of their face. We look, and I look because I'm involved in the jail ministry, at mug shots. That's a picture of a person's face. They never use the hind part, ever. So, it's the face that counts, okay? Moving on. What does no man has seen God at any time have to do with the rest of that verse? If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Since no man has seen God at any time and unless the Spirit of God is drawing the lost man, the lost man has no desire to see God, let alone love God. 
What chance does man have of ever being reconciled to God? Religion will not do it. For every man in this world is religious according to the dictates of his own heart. You might say, well, I'm not religious. I'm not even sure I believe in God. I'd like to talk to you after the service. My friend, you're mistaken, for your religious system is what you think, and you are the God of your own religious belief system. How well does something like that work? Proverbs 16.25 has the answer to that question. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It's not by luck that someone learns of God's great love for the lost man. It's not as the Calvinists proclaim that God chooses some to dwell with him in eternity and he chooses others to perish in the fires of the great abyss beyond. Luck has nothing to do with it. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All is the key term. It's not some lottery system that you get saved and others don't. I'm glad it's not got anything to do with luck, because I don't know if I'd be lucky enough. Although, if you think about this, I imagine Satan would be thrilled for a chance to throw the dice. His chances would be much better than the end that he's heading for according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. Let's turn there once, just for fun. Revelation 20 and verse 10. Satan knows his end. In Revelation verse 20 and verse 10, we read, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, and day and night, and day and night, forever and ever. I added a few days and nights in there, you noticed. This is the second death that the lost man experiences. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but this way that seems right, this way of man's religion always leads to man's expression of godlessness. It never leads to godly spirituality. The religious man who will not bow to Christ's incarnate love breathes every breath in submission to Satan, who is the God of all religion. All religions follow the great deceiver to the same end, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Unless the lost man can see some evidence and have some hope that there is a loving God that cares for him, how will he ever even take a chance on that bloody sacrifice of forgiveness? Why would he hope for life eternal even though the tomb is empty? You see, the answer is not in a religion or in an organization. The answer is in you. You, the saved by grace. Me, you might say. I don't even know what the question is. Well, God asked Isaiah the question in chapter 6 and verse 8 of Isaiah. You don't need to turn there. You're familiar with it. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, 
Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah's response, here am I, send me. You know, God tells us, he tells you and me the same thing he told Isaiah. What did he tell Isaiah? Go and tell this people. God's a bit more specific, though, when it comes to us, to the uh, saved by grace, to the New Testament Christian. Matthew 28, 19, God gives the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He says it again in Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And he gives the same orders in Luke and John. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When? After that the Holy Ghost has come upon us. You see, God dwelleth in the believer and his love is perfected in the believer. When does the Holy Ghost come upon the believer? Immediately, at the moment of salvation. It is the Holy Ghost that gives every believer the power to love one another. There are things that happen in our Christian life that are automatic. They happen and we don't really even know it. When you get saved, your record is wiped clean. No more sins recorded on your record. After that, God forbid you might sin, they're not recorded on your record. What is on your record? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus' righteousness is placed on the believer and on his record. As a matter of fact, when you get saved, nothing can be done to reverse or change your salvation. You can never get lost again. You can't ever be impeached. Isn't that good news? This is the hated concept of the once saved, always saved. I, for the life of me, can't understand why there are so many isms that hate the security of the believer. I guess when a man knows that he knows that he knows he's saved, and he gains that confidence through the witness of the Holy Spirit which dwells in him and the Word of God, it's difficult for anybody to manipulate them. It's difficult to get a Christian to do something that they're not supposed to do or to believe something that they're not supposed to believe. Never forget this. False teaching is always done for a purpose, whether the person teaching it knows it or not. It's to keep the Christian from doing something he shouldn't do or possibly keep that person who's not a Christian from getting saved. Now, there are some things that are not automatic in the Christian life. More to our point, we must voluntarily allow God to perfect his love in us. You might say, well, why wouldn't anyone want God to perfect his love in us? And I thought, well, there's only a couple reasons. One might be rebellion, and the other one may be ignorance. Rebellion, not good. God says rebellion is worse than the sin of witchcraft. Ignorance is not stupidity. It just means you haven't been taught. Maybe you're still in that milk stage. We must cooperate with God whose dwelling place we are to perfect his love in us. Bill Long and I were talking last week, and he said, David, 
you know, there just isn't enough love in this world. He said, there's so much hate everywhere you turn. And I said, I know what you mean. I agree. Love does not seem to be a bountiful commodity in our society. And I'm not sure it's any different than it ever was, but it sure seems worse. As I was preparing this message, I was reflecting on that conversation with Bill, and it was like reality hit me, or I guess maybe you could say love hit me right between the eyes. All the love that ever was, all the love that is, and all the love that ever will be was poured out on that old rugged cross on Calvary. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, poured out his love for every man, woman, and child. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The critic, the naysayer, might claim that God's love must have been all used up for there's none left to go around today. Where is his love to comfort the grief-stricken, the homeless, the rebellious, the drug addict, the racist, the wayward of every imagination? Yes, even these can experience God's love, for the Bible addresses them personally, whosoever, whosoever. But where will they find it? How can it be discovered? Remember, they're not looking for God's love. They're looking for something, and almost paradoxically, they certainly don't want anything to do with God, who is the source of love. Remember, God asked Isaiah, who will go for us? And Isaiah volunteers, he answers the clarion call, Here am I, send me. Paul, as if responding to the question God asked Isaiah, writes in Romans chapter 10, How shall they preach except they be sent? How shall they preach the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, except they be sent. Side note, don't you just love the way our pastor reminds us at the end of service that we're not dismissed? I got to thinking about that. I thought, I wonder why he does that. I thought, because as Christians, we can't, we dare not, we must not ever dismiss the love of God. He only postpones the service until we meet again. He sends us out to spread the love of God, for God is love. We're not dismissed. We're sent, just like Isaiah said. No man has seen God at any time. How will they see this love of God when they can't see God? We know that some men during Jesus' time on earth did see the very likeness of God. What they saw was not God, for God is a spirit. The Bible calls the one they saw the express image of his person, being the brightness of his glory and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Many saw firsthand the love of God and even experienced during that time. I'm thinking of that thief on the cross. Even though he did not see God, he saw God's love in action that day. He saw God's love hanging between heaven and earth. For him. Some might say, but don't we need a new injection of God's love for today? It seems like 
evil is winning the day everywhere you look. Maybe we do. We need God's love each and every day. There's no doubt about that. But ask ourselves this question. Are we using that love that we already have? Why would God need to give us any more if we're not using what we already have? You see, if we don't figure it out, if we can't figure it out, it's you, it's me, the blood-bought sons of God. We are the source of love for this dying world. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. God the Holy Ghost. God is love. Brothers and sisters, we are his temple. Every Christian receives that which Jesus promised he would send. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The comforter, God the Holy Ghost, love dwells in every believer. I'm reminded of Cleophas and his companion as they walked the road to Emmaus. You remember our pastor just taught a lesson on that recently. Cleophas and his companion were joined along the way by Jesus. Now, even though they knew Jesus, even though they had spent time with Jesus, and now Jesus was giving them a lesson from the walking, talking Word of God, the real living Bible. They still didn't realize it was the resurrected Christ that accompanied them. Interestingly, our text today says no man has seen God at any time. And now Cleophas and his companion, they see, they hear, and they talk to the express image of God. And at first, they don't see God. They don't see the express image. They just see a man. Thank God something happened. It wasn't something that Cleophas and his companion did. It was, some, it was not anything that suddenly occurred to them or they realized. I believe it was something that Jesus did. The Bible doesn't say for sure. I used to think that when Jesus was breaking the breads, they probably saw the nail prints in his hand. It's not even mentioned in that account. The scripture in Luke says, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him. I spent a lot of time wrestling with this verse 12, and it might seem like we're dancing around a little bit. It says, no man has seen God at any time. If we can't see the connection between that truth, that God cannot, uh, does, uh, that no man sees God at any time, and the propagation of the gospel by those who have God dwelling in them and God's love perfected in them, we're going to miss what God's trying to communicate to us. Have you ever been in the presence of a lost person? Of course you have. Some might say, well, probably, most likely, for sure. Did that person see God when he was in your presence? Is that a fair question to ask? It might even be a question that will be posed at the judgment seat of Christ. Who knows? Maybe. Well, I know who knows. Think about it. Well, I usually try to invite people to church. That's good. But did they see Jesus? I usually try to carry tracts and give out gospel tracts. And that's good, and we should do that. 
but do they see Jesus? I love the bumper sticker I see on people's cars that says, wise men still seek him. You know why I like that so much? It makes me feel like I'm wise. <laughs> That's good to have bumper stickers like that. But is it going to cause people to see Jesus? Maybe. I'm captivated by that account in Luke of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. When Jesus joined Cleophas and his companion, verse 16 says, But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. What in the world could the Lord want us to learn from that account? No man has seen God at any time. God, the Holy Spirit, inhabits every Christian. But does the world see Jesus? Or do they just see Dave Fawcett? That's the question. The eyes of the world have been blinded, lest they should see the glorious gospel of Christ and be saved. Turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to start reading at verse 1, and we'll read down to verse 7. In verse 1, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... What ministry is that? The ministry of reconciliation. We talked about that last week. As we have received mercy, we faint not. Those blood-bought Christians have received mercy. They've received forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. And if things get a little tough, if we have to work a little hard, we just don't faint. We remember what it was like to be lost but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully. We don't tell people how to get saved contrary to the word of God. That is our source. We're not dishonest about it. We're not trying to trick them into getting saved. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. When you give somebody the gospel, your conscience should be clear that you're saying what God said, not what you think. And it goes on to say, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. How can our gospel be hid? If we keep our mouth shut, if we keep that track in, in our pocket and we don't hand it out, it's hid to them that are lost. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servant for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now he says here, Paul to the Corinthians, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Nice way to say we're nothing but dirt that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's God that saves. We can't save anyone, but we can tell them where to go, who to go to. If God doesn't open their eyes, they'll never see Jesus. They won't see Jesus in the church service. They won't see him in a track. They won't see him on a Christian t-shirt or a bumper sticker. 
let alone in Dave Fawcett. We must realize we are treading on holy ground when it comes to the ministry of reconciliation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, if coming to Christ is the single most important event in your life, can it be any less important in the life of one who is lost? The lost man does not know how important it is to get saved. So we must embrace that importance for them. And that is exactly why God has given the saved of his spirit, that we might love the lost enough to show them Jesus. Do we love them enough? Do we love Jesus enough? Not to just feel sorry for them, but love them enough to tell them the truth. Brothers and sisters, the truth is what they need. Oh, we know, and probably a lot of us can quote 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We know Jesus came to save the lost men by being the propitiation for their sins. But just like John the Baptist came as the forerunner to introduce Israel to Jesus, Jesus has selected you, the blood-bought Christian, to be his forerunner, his messenger. And what is the message we're to deliver to the lost? It's the same message, it's the same answer Jesus gave Pilate. How is that? Well, let's look. John 18, 37. The Gospel of John, the 18th chapter, the 37th verse. In John chapter 18, verse 37, we read, Pilate therefore said unto him, that's unto Jesus, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness Unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Jesus answered Pilate that he came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Jesus is that truth, John 14, 6. His word is truth, John 17, 17. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. <sighs> Love one another. How? By caring enough to tell them the truth. Tell them the truth, but I don't want to hurt their feelings. I know. I don't want to hurt their feelings either. How many times have you not told them the truth? You've not spoken the truth because you didn't want to hurt their feelings. You know, I've come to realize that not wanting to hurt somebody's feeling is just an excuse and it will not keep them out of hell. For they are condemned already because they've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I was thinking just recently, I mentioned this last week, someone I know is lost. I thought, boy, their condition is terrible. Their attitude is beyond understanding. Their life's a mess. I felt sorry for them for just a moment. But then I realized feeling sorry for those who are embroiled in the affairs and the mess and the strife of this world does not change them. It does not help them. And if you feel sorry for them, it's only a distraction to keep you from doing what's right. People all over the world feel sorry for themselves 
They don't need us to feel sorry for them. We need to feel what Jesus feels for the lost. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We'll start reading at 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, it's important to see Jesus healed every sickness and every disease. We want to understand that because we want to see what he's talking about in the next verses. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with sorrow? No, compassion. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. He was moved with compassion because of their spiritual condition. Verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Look at the next word. What's that next word say? Pray. Pray. We need to have the same compassion that Jesus does. We need to pray. David said in Psalms 142.4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I pray to God that no one I know will crash the gates of hell with that alibi on their lips. No man cared for my soul. No man has seen God at any time, but they've seen you, and they've seen me, brothers and sisters. If I'm saved, God has fully equipped me. Verse 13 says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And verse 12 says, And his love is perfected in us. What is the evidence of this? We'll love one another. If we love them enough to show them the truth, is that enough? Is that all there is to it? Is that the end of our obligation? Remember how important your salvation is to you. We know how important the salvation of one soul is to Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Paul tells us something here about Jesus. First Timothy 2, 4, Paul says, Jesus, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. All men. Look at verse 1. Paul says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. All men. You mean the ones you want to see come to Jesus? Absolutely, especially those. Luke 18, 1 says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Is there a secret ingredient when you witness to somebody to be effective? Is there a secret 
formula for soul winning? I don't know that there is, but if it is, I think it's prayer. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15. Looking at verse 7, we read John 15, verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will. John says we're to ask. That sounds like prayer, doesn't it? Does it sound like prayer? I think it does. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Does God want the say the lost to be saved? He does. He says, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. That's conditional. If my words abide in you, Read them, study them, memorize them, reflect on them, meditate on them. Let them guide your life, lead your life, and be the answer to every question in your life. You shall ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. How many people do you know that are lost, that you'd like to see saved? He goes on to say, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now you could argue that that's the fruit of the Spirit, or you could say, well, that's the fruit of a Christian. Either way, I think it comes back to pleasing God, because as the Father hath loved me, in verse 9, so have I loved you, continue ye in my love. Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Isn't there a verse in the Bible that says that there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth? I think that's the type of joy John's talking about here, the joy of seeing people get saved. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. I might hand out a track. I might walk with someone down the Romans road. I may invite them to church. They'll see Dave Fawcett, but will they see Jesus? We dare not go through the motion of caring for the lost without bathing the effort in prayer. Because if God doesn't open their eyes, one thing is for sure, they'll see the flames of hell for eternity. Verse 13 goes on to say, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. How much of your life are you willing to lay down in prayer for that one who is teetering on the brink of eternity? The best sermon I ever heard on prayer was by a preacher south of the Ohio River. His name was Joe Henry Hankins. He's gone to be with the Lord. But he said this, The gospel reaches souls on the wings of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father, we do thank you for your word. We do thank you for John, who in very few words showed us that unless the Christian shows the lost man Jesus, He'll never see God in any form, at any time, and he'll spend eternity in hell. 
Father, we pray that if there's a person here and the sound of my voice that does not know Christ as Savior, any time during the day they can call into the church and someone will talk to them. Someone will take the time to love them enough to tell them about Jesus who died on an old rugged cross to pay the price for their sin. And all they have to do is put their faith and trust in Christ for the saving of their souls. Father, we thank you as Christians that you have equipped us. You've given us everything we need. I believe that you'll nurture any desire we have to reach the lost. But you won't make us because we're a volunteer army. We pray, Father, that our numbers would grow and that our ranks would swell and that we would follow Jesus, the captain of our souls. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name. We praise you and thank you. Amen. We have a nice group of uh, young people away at camp this week, and uh, they're with our pastor, Ben, and a staff of other folks uh, that are uh, helping them and counseling them. Pray for them. Pray that they'll do what God wants them to do in their lives. And it will be different for every one of them, probably. Pray that the counselors will be challenged in their own spiritual walk to do that which God shows them. And pray for a binding, a bonding together of our group at Chautauqua. Pray that they'll make other friends and encourage others as well. We look forward to their return. There will be a 412 meeting this coming Sunday for adult teachers and leaders. That's at 12 minutes after 4, and I believe it's right here in the sanctuary. Children's Choir has started. They meet at 5 o'clock on Sunday evenings, and it's age 3 years old through the 6th grade. How many of you know people that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Almost every one of us. Let's close this evening by just asking the Lord to do a miracle in their lives. Father, we do lift up the lost. And I say the lost as they're around the world. We specifically think about the ones that we know that are lost. Some of them we are praying for already. Some we've been praying for for some time. Father, we pray that your word would abide in our hearts, that we might ask for the salvation of their souls, and that we might have what we ask for as promised in your word. We know that's holy ground. We don't take it light. We may even tremble thinking what a great responsibility it, uh, it is. But we know this. When we are obedient to your word, things make more sense. You show us more, and things begin to happen. So, Father, we pray that we would be obedient to your word and that when we lift up and pray for the souls of lost people, that you'll open their eyes and that they'll respond in faith to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming.